Um, let me introduce Jason Torrey, a physical therapist and runner, a triathlete, and general all-around good guy who's been helping us out with these presentations. Um, he's here to talk about Achilles tendinopathy, um, or well, I guess we'll figure out whether it's really called tendinopathy anymore, though they keep changing the names on all of these things. So, uh, so Jason, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and take it away? Sure. All right. Go. I already see that all right. Looks like it. Okay. All right. So uh, it is called Achilles tendinopathy. That's, that is what we are calling it now. Um, this presentation is going to be all about this injury, the second most common running injury that we see. And there's going to be a lot of common themes between the last two presentations. So if you're just tuning into this one and haven't seen the other two, they are all posted on the forum. Uh, and you won't really be missing out on anything. You can always go back to watch the replays. So here's me. I'm a PT, running coach, strength coach, runner, like to work on the calves, all that good stuff. Still don't have a conflict of interest, still waiting on that. And so tonight we're going to talk about uh, some relevant anatomy and how we diagnose an Achilles tendinopathy, some of the known risk factors, and then uh, the back half of the presentation is pretty much just all about management. So why we get Achilles pain, solutions, answer questions, because it's confusing. You got to start off with a little history of Achilles, right? So uh, this tendon has been a big deal for a long time, it turns out. There's the uh, the Greek hero Achilles, who famously was killed by getting shot through his heel with an arrow, uh, recognizing that this picture actually depicts that he's getting shot through the foot, that is not his Achilles. Uh, but yeah, so for a while, Hippocrates, one of the, the real early figures in medicine, hypothesized that if you cut or bruise this tendon, it brings on fevers, choking, derangement of the mind at length, bringing death. Um, I, I haven't seen any of that in the uh, resources that I was looking up to prepare this presentation, but uh, it's possible that at one time that was the case. Uh, now, we don't really see that. We do see that it's a pretty, pretty debilitating running related injury. Um, what are we talking about as far as the Achilles tendon goes? Uh, pretty easy to find. It's the big old tendon right in the backside of the heel. Can't miss it. Uh, very end of the calf muscle and our calf muscle complex that consists of the soleus, which is a deeper, stronger plantar flexor muscle, and the gastrocnemius, which is divided into the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius. So what is a tendinopathy? This is a little bit more of a complex question. So tendinopathy basically uh, being tendon pathology used to be called tendinitis, and then it was called tendinosis. Uh, because it was recognized that inflammation was not necessarily the driver of the symptoms. Uh, now we call it tendinopathy because it's not necessarily tendinosis either, osis being a, a chronic degeneration. Um, what we see with tendinopathy is that you have three components of pain, uh, dysfunction, and strict tendon pathology, and those are all not necessarily interrelated. So you have uh, tendon pathology, and, and usually what we see in the tendon pathology is that very small tendon cells get disorganized within this matrix. Uh, it's a very small percentage of the tendon that actually has this pathology. Uh, and later on in terms of treatment, there's this phrase, uh, you treat the, the donut, not the hole, where the hole is referring to the, the pathology itself and the donut being the rest of the tendon that we're able to rehabilitate. Um, but it's possible to have this pathology and have it be completely asymptomatic, which then kind of brings on the question of whether this is a pathology or not, or whether it's really a diagnosis. Uh, but generally, we would consider a tendinopathy to be this presentation of pain and some sort of dysfunction, whether or not there is structural pathology on imaging. And that imaging is typically uh, either ultrasound or MRI imaging. The two main types of Achilles tendinopathy that we typically see are mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy and insertional Achilles tendinopathy. 
aptly titled because it either hurts right in the middle. Sometimes there's a thickened nodule or a thickening of the, the tendon with the tendinopathy, uh, or it hurts right as the Achilles is inserting into the calcaneus. And there was really only one consideration in my mind as far as the differences between rehabilitation between these two. So for the most part, I'm just going to be talking about Achilles tendon rehab. Uh, and the only other consideration just may be that with an insertional Achilles tendinopathy, we have more symptoms into the backside of our heel as we're dorsiflexing or, or pointing the ankle up towards us. So kind of that classic um, stretching the calf behind us or dropping our heels down off of a step at that very bottom point, you typically see more symptoms with a, an insertional Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, some differential diagnoses. If uh, you're thinking that you may or may not have an Achilles tendinopathy, if it's not basically right at the end of the tendon or within the first couple of centimeters north of the calcaneus, uh, it's probably not an Achilles tendinopathy. So some common other things that may be getting uh, diagnosed outside of Achilles tendinopathy would be a Haglund's deformity, which is a, a calcification buildup uh, where the, the Achilles tendon meets the calcaneus. Ostrigonum, which is typically goes along with posterior ankle impingement syndrome, uh, where there's a congenital extra bone right behind the ankle joint. Uh, Retrocalcaneal bursitis, and a lot of the times tendinopathies are misdiagnosed as bursitis, but this one's pretty hard to miss because the bursa on either side of the tendon totally blow up. It, there's a ton of swelling and a lot of point tenderness, uh, so that is not an Achilles tendinopathy. Severs disease, which is uh, commonly seen in adolescence, it's kind of like the uh, Osgood-Schlatter of the ankle, so the, it's an Achilles tendon calcaneus traction injury uh, with someone who doesn't have a closed growth plate and Achilles tears and calf tears. And so even though tendinopathy is that pathology of the tendon, we would put a, a tendon tear in a different category. Why is it so common? This slide should look pretty familiar because uh, it's almost the same slide that I used for patellofemoral pain talk. 10% uh, of all running injuries between recorded between 1983 and 2016 are Achilles tendinopathy. That is a very large amount of injuries, uh, probably because of those, those muscular contributions. So the calf and the Achilles are loaded the most out of anything that propels us as we run. Um, so we can probably just chalk that up to, well, yeah, anything that's getting used the most is probably gonna have a pretty high incidence of injury in that area. When we look at risk factors, it's definitely not that clean or not that clear cut. Uh, but some common themes that we do see pretty consistently, or if you have a, a previous history of Achilles tendinopathy, then that is a risk factor for developing it in the future. Overuse and overload, you know, pretty common uh, risk factor for any running related injury. So the strict too much too soon after too little for too long. Calf strength deficits are pretty well documented, although calf strength normative values are not well documented. So how can you really say that somebody has a calf strength deficit if there's no normative value? That's a pretty valid question. Um, well, there are some things that we'll, we'll talk about all these individually in a, in a, in a minute here. Um, high breaking forces and training on softer surfaces, a couple biomechanical factors that are much further down the risk factor category. They're definitely not present in all cases of Achilles tendinopathy, but there is uh, some evidence that they can relate to that and having high BMI. Our classic load versus capacity, this is a pretty general explanation for all running related injuries. So why something, why some tissue in the body might not necessarily have the tolerance to handle what we're putting into the system. So if our capacity is just the amount of force that our Achilles can tolerate and our load is the amount that we're putting into it, and a running injury happens when that load exceeds capacity. Calf strength deficits. Um, I was just talking to Adam a little bit about this before the presentation started. So we clinically, one thing that's really easy to just get a baseline measure of somebody's calf performance is by doing a single leg heel raise test and having them do controlled single leg heel raises 
uh, whether it's off of a step or whether it's flat from the ground and counting the amount that they can do on one side versus the other. Uh, the problem with that is that that becomes a proxy for estimating someone's maximal force output. Uh, and if you can do 30 repetitions of something, uh, it's not very good at actually estimating what's the most force that that muscle group could put out. It says that you have pretty good strength endurance, uh, but it doesn't tell you that much about max strength output. Um, so clinically, I, I use something uh, called an, iso uh, an isokinetic dynamometer in the clinic. I also use a handheld dynamometer and have a couple setups where basically have somebody pushing into a dynamometer. It's not moving, so it's on a fixed surface. Uh, and that can give us a measure of somebody's maximal force output. Uh, that's actually the, the value that seems to be clinically correlated with Achilles tendinopathy. So um, somebody could have pretty good calf strength endurance, but if their max force output is low, that may be a risk factor for developing Achilles tendinopathy down the road. And a couple of those running biomechanics factors that I mentioned, so breaking forces, and running on softer surfaces. Breaking forces first, this one's pretty intuitive. So as we're running with each step, there is a force that resists us from going further. Uh, the, the muscle groups that are taking up that breaking force are primarily the quadriceps and the calf muscle complex. So we, we kind of think that uh, in some of these studies that have shown runners with high breaking forces go on to develop Achilles tendinopathy there may be a link between this high amount of breaking force that the calf has to overcome and probably going back to that uh, overuse or overload model. There's only so much that it can take before it can't take anymore. Uh, one counterintuitive finding that we see with uh, most foot and ankle pathology is actually that running on softer surfaces seems to be a risk factor for developing foot and ankle pain, uh, Achilles tendinopathy and plantar heel pain as, as some other diagnoses. Uh, this has to do with a, a biomechanical property called stiffness. So stiffness being the uh, amount of force and change of length that uh, the limb has to go through with each step. And specifically on a tendon level, uh, the amount of, of force that the tendon is contracting with and the distance that it's displacing. Uh, basically, uh, an easy way to think about this is if you're jumping on a trampoline, in order for your body to not fully collapse once you get to that, that lowest point on the trampoline, it tries to stiffen up and hold everything very, very tight to try to keep the body upright and lined up without losing too much height. Uh, and that's what the foot and ankle has to do when it lands on soft surfaces. So we, we would kind of call this soft surface either a very, very compliant foam or running on sand, running on very soft trails, grass, things like that. Uh, it's going to increase the stiffness of the Achilles. And even though stiffness is a property that uh, is good for performance, it does seem to be linked to the development of an Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, and you could probably also chalk that up to, well, yeah, if they're doing a lot of that, if they have to do a lot of these stiff contractions over time, then it's kind of more ends up being an overuse or overload reasoning, not maybe so much the the fact that somebody was just running on soft surfaces. Um, so that's why I don't put, I don't put too much stock into the specific running biomechanic factors because the training load itself is so much more influential compared to some of these smaller variables. Uh, and I have a little bit about shoes on here because Adam wanted to know a little bit about shoes. So it's always a fun thing to talk about. Um, same explanation as far as shoes go, uh, slight modification of biomechanical factors, but uh, largely not influential compared to the, the bulk of it, which is the training volume and the training load. Uh, so a minimalist shoe does typically shift load more towards the foot and ankle. And it's documented that if you transition from uh, being in a, just a regular neutral shoe to a minimalist shoe too quickly, we do see more foot and ankle injuries. Uh, the, the heel to toe drop seems to matter less than overall cushioning. So you could have something say like an ultra Escalante racer, which is a, a zero millimeter heel to toe drop. And it's also a very, very light and minimalist shoe uh, compared to uh, something like a Hoka, which has a zero millimeter heel to toe drop, but a very, very thick stack height and, and, and it's a lot heavier. 
the heel to toe drop in those situations isn't really what's making the difference. It's the fact that the shoe is lighter and forcing someone to land a little bit more on their forefoot. Uh, so it's more the effect of the minimalist shoes weight and design and less about heel to toe drop in terms of loading at the foot and ankle. Uh, and it is worth mentioning that there haven't been any shoe studies that have specifically uh, pointed towards a relationship with Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, we do just see some of these biomechanical factors kind of make sense, but at the end of the day, it's, you could chalk it up more as a training error if somebody switches into a shoe too much too soon uh, because they're just loading something that hasn't been used to loading that way. So going to our treatment strategies, uh, this slide should also look pretty similar to the management of patellofemoral pain. There's, there are a lot of similarities between those two injuries, but there are, there are a couple key differences. Uh, thinking, you know, again, that reference to uh, the treatment of tendinopathy is treating the donut, not the hole. So if somebody does have this path, part of a tendon that's pathological, what ends up working is not necessarily that the, the pathology is being cured by exercise. Uh, it's that the rest of the tendon is improving its load tolerance. Uh, it's hypertrophying, so it's, it's getting larger. And it's basically filling in the space and filling in the amount of dysfunction that the other part of the tendon is having. Um, so a lot of our treatment is targeted towards the healthy tissue, not that we can bias one way or the other when we're loading a tendon. Um, but exercise interventions are the gold standard for treating any tendinopathy, and we'll get into the specifics of those. What I want to talk about first are training old modifications and gait retraining, not because I think that they are the most important things uh, as far as the evidence-based management of tendinopathy, but because from a clinician standpoint, my job is to keep runners running as much as they possibly could while not making anything worse. Because if I have to shut somebody down completely from running for a long time, it takes a really, really long time to build them back up to where they were. Um, so the effective treatment strategy early on is saying, okay, what's the minimal amount that we can continue to run to also get this thing better? And that's what we'll jump into here as far as training load modifications. So one thing that really usually has to happen is decreasing intensity of some kind. So obviously these, these training load recommendations are going to be individualized to every runner. So I can't tell you, you know, just decrease your pace from five to six minute miles. Um, it's, it's all obviously relative to the amount of runs that somebody is running in a week, their pacing, their, you know, the terrain that they're doing. Um, but typically if we can reduce just some biomechanical strain on the Achilles tendon, they can tolerate things a lot better. So we want to decrease some running pace. Uh, if somebody's still continuing to do workouts and they're having this, this painful tendinopathy that doesn't seem to be improving on its own, we probably need to decrease some of those high end workouts. Um, and that also includes hill workouts too. So we think, you know, of, of running up and down hills. Uh, even if we're doing them at a slower pace, that's still high intensity from a tendon standpoint. Tendon doesn't care how fast you're running. It cares how much load is going into it. So from that standpoint, we need to decrease in intensity. Uh, the other aspects are, are clearly, uh, we need to work on recovery between runs, uh, recovery in general, right? So, you know, our, our meme on the left here, uh, not that unrealistic when it comes to some, some runners non-running behavior. So, uh, yeah, approaching the approaching not running as also something that needs to happen, uh, and and perhaps possibly decreasing total running volume as well, uh, but doing as little of this as we need to do to keep runners running. Gait retraining, running biomechanics. Last time with patellofemoral pain, we talked about increasing someone's running cadence to decrease load at the knee. Uh, there is definitely less evidence on increasing cadence for decreasing Achilles tendon pain, uh, but there is biomechanical plausibility because there's, there uh, have been studies on the effects of increasing running cadence to decrease peak braking forces. Uh, and going back to the biomechanical risk factors, we see that uh, high braking force is correlated with that, that risk factor to develop Achilles tendinopathy, and it does load the Achilles more. So if we decrease peak braking forces by increasing someone's running cadence, uh, that can be a strategy to help somebody run with a little less pain uh, or run a little bit longer until they get to the point of symptoms. 
So now we'll get to my favorite part, the uh, resistance training for tendon health. Um, regardless of where somebody is at from, a, from the running standpoint, what we need to do is eventually get them to load the tendon in a slow controlled manner and preferably heavy. Um, so the tendon responds very well to uh, high, slow tensile loading, especially early on. Uh, even, even a pretty painful tendon can tolerate uh, pretty heavy isometric contractions oftentimes. Uh, once, once somebody can tolerate an isometric contraction, which is just pushing against the surface where nothing is moving, uh, progressing to moving through the range. This is where the consideration between a mid portion and a, uh, an insertional Achilles tendinopathy might differ. We might choose to start someone with an insertional Achilles tendinopathy, not really cranking them down into a dorsiflexion, but starting just flat from the floor and then pressing up into plantar flexion and back down. Um, so one of the uh, pretty landmark trials uh, on resistance training for Achilles tendinopathy compared uh, the classic Alfredson protocol. And the Alfredson protocol for tendinopathy was doing three sets of 15 eccentric heel raises with your knee straight and three sets of 15 eccentric heel raises with your knee bent two different times in a day. So 180 repetitions in a day, every single day, an eccentric being your only resisting force on the way down and your other leg is helping you on the way back up. Um, so even if that was the gold standard, which at this point, it does not seem like it is anymore, that is uh, not something that most people are gonna be very compliant with. Asking them to do 90 repetitions in the morning and 90 repetitions in the evening, that just doesn't seem to be a reasonable strategy for solving something like this. Uh, so what this group did was they compared one, one group in the randomized controlled trial just did the Alfredson protocol with Achilles tendinopathy. And the other group did three exercises uh, that were heavy, slow resistance based, and they did them three times a week. So the time commitment was significantly less in this group. Um, and what, what I really liked about this too is that we have evidence that heavy resistance training helps runners from a performance standpoint. So even if these two interventions were equivocal, which they ended up being in this trial, in my mind, the heavy slow resistance training is the way to go because you at least get performance benefits from a running standpoint by doing this stuff. You don't necessarily get performance benefits by doing lighter, heavy, or lighter resistance, higher repetition stuff uh, like in the Alfredson protocol. So the three exercises in this protocol were uh, a single leg heel raise in a Smith machine, the picture on the left here, uh, heel raises in a, a seated calf raise machine. So basically the, the exercise on the left targets more of the gastrocnemius and the exercise on the right targets the soleus, which is the stronger of the two calf muscles and probably the one that we're not as great at loading because it is trickier to load. Um, the third exercise was uh, doing a similar exercise to the one on the left, but using a leg press. So just doing a leg press plantar flexion exercise. Um, so given that a lot of us don't have access to gyms right now, some common substitutes that I've had people do for resistance training, still kind of taking these same fundamentals. Uh, the straight leg version, uh, what I often have people do or take, take one foot, put it two rungs up on a set of stairs and the other foot just drops right down off the back of one step. And you have weights either in your hands or on your back or on in a backpack, wherever you wanna hold it. Uh, the leg in front basically just stabilizes you so that you're not wobbling around and you have both hands free so that you can hold onto weights. Uh, so that would be kind of your, your standard heavy loading exercise for the calf with the leg straight. Uh, the leg bent is still pretty challenging because we, we can do a lot more from a resistance standpoint than we expect with this exercise. Uh, some people reach peak forces of two times body weight with uh, an isometric max contraction of their soleus. So even if you put a single, uh, single weight that was your body weight on the top of your knee, it's probably not even heavy enough to do this exercise at home, which is why it really requires a machine or a Smith machine, something like that at the gym to work it very heavy. Uh, but one thing that we can set up, so the picture on the right is an isometric exercise where that's not a resistance band. That's just a, a belt that is not moving at all. So you set your leg up in this looped belt 
and you go up into plantar flexion and the belt should stop you from going any further and you push into the belt as hard as you can. So that's one way to at home achieve this high intensity uh, contraction, but not necessarily need a significant amount of resistance or other materials involved. Um, I have a lot of other ideas on how you can load the calf. This is a blog post that I put out, unfortunately, right before COVID. So when the gyms closed, uh, I was telling people how they could have strengthened their calf. But yeah, if you want some ideas on different things like that, I have a whole thing on it. What does this look like? So from the three time a week standpoint, uh, clearly, if somebody is in a lot of pain, we're not going to be pushing those high intensities through the range right off the bat. We need to work our way up to that. And that's, that's a pretty consistent theme with all resistance training. So you're not just starting jumping into the heaviest possible thing. Uh, so week one was uh, three sets of a 15 repetition max and a 15 repetition max basically means you could not do a 16th rep with quality. So it's enough weight where you're topping out at 15 repetitions. Weeks two through three, increase the weight a little bit, decrease the rep range. So now you're topping out at 12 repetitions. Uh, weeks four to five, jumping up to 10 repetitions, which at this point now is getting close to about the 75% of what somebody's one repetition max would be. And by week nine and on, you're up to a six repetition max with these exercises. Uh, and usually between a six and an eight repetition max is heavy enough as far as loading a tendon goes. So if you can get to that point, um, that's usually that's usually the range where the tendon responds very well to loading, uh, and also the convenient range where runners improve their running economy by lifting weights that heavy. Um, so that's that's kind of the spot that I like to see most people get up to. Uh, but it doesn't actually stop with the heavy slow resistance stuff, and this is probably where. Um, we're not finishing off the rehab very well because most of the time at, at this point you get, you get up to your, your six repetition max, things are feeling pretty good. You've normalized strength, but you haven't actually worked on anything power or energy, energy storage related, which is the main role of the Achilles tendon. So the calf muscle has to contract and be very strong, but the Achilles tendon has to store and release energy. Uh, so that is something that we need to practice towards the end stage of rehab. Um, it's uh, in putting some pictures up, I realized that uh, putting pictures of doing plyometrics up doesn't really show you how to do plyometrics. Uh, and I also didn't know how to embed videos, but I, I post a lot of this stuff on, on my Instagram account. I have, I have a lot of videos of this stuff. So feel free to contact me if you have questions about specific exercises. From a plyometric training standpoint, uh, the ones that I'm most focused on clinically are the pogo hop, which is basically a jump rope type motion uh, where it's really minimal knee bend and most of the motion is coming from our ankle. Uh, so you're, you're hopping up and down. You're not really letting your heels touch the ground and you're trying to go for height. So it's a really explosive jump and you're trying to spend very, very little amount of time on the ground. So most, most ground contact times, we want a cue to be less than 250 milliseconds. That's about the time that somebody, an, an elite runner is going to be spending on the ground as they're running. So the foot contact during running is very, very quick. Uh, and to train that property, we have to train the same way when we're doing plyometric training. So pogo hops, uh, starting in double leg, progressing to single leg, uh, our classic track warm-up series like A skips and B skips, all of these things are helping to, to build some of that elastic bouncy nature to the Achilles tendon. Uh, and it really doesn't require that high of a volume. So from a training volume standpoint, starting off with plyometrics, you may start off between three and five sets of three to five reps. So they should be really quality, but they're high load. So we don't want to be doing 100 to 200 repetitions in a set. Then we're just kind of running. So you know, if we're if, if we're running, we're getting the high repetition type stuff from a, from a power plyometric standpoint, it's high intensity, but low volume. Uh, and there was a study that came out recently. that was a proof of concept study uh, looking at a, at a specific program and taking runners with Achilles tendinopathy through them. And actually in this program, they did, they did keep the hopping volume and jumping volume pretty high. This is actually a little higher than you would typically see. Uh, but the runners did well because that's what happens in most exercise-based studies it's tracked over time. 
Um, so that's that's kind of like the the last stage of the rehab in nature is mixing in some of this power and polymetric training. Remembering the traffic light for all stages. So whether this is day one starting on isometrics or you know getting back into high-end track workouts towards the end stage of Achilles tendinopathy rehab. Um, our our you know, kind of classic red light, yellow light, green light describing if symptoms are escalating, the more we're doing something versus if symptoms are present but tolerable versus if symptoms are present at the start and then warm up. And one thing that you definitely hear a lot of for uh, somebody that runs with a chronic tendinopathy is that the first mile feels like total garbage and then the second mile feels a little bit better and then by the time they get back home, they forgot that they were even injured. So that's that's your green light situation because it has the classic kind of tendon warm up effect, which is very common with most tendinopathies. Prevention strategies, uh, you know, there's not really great prevention strategies for almost any injury. Achilles tendinopathy is no different there. But if I had to revisit my list of listening to your body, managing previous injuries, avoiding frequent spikes in training and selecting a sustainable training plan. Uh, this obviously looks exactly like the uh, prevention for patellofemoral pain. Uh, but what I would probably extra emphasize here is in the management of previous injuries, tendinopathy does seem to be linked to that future bout of tendinopathy. And we do seem to be not so great at finishing off the rehab. So going back to that getting to really heavy resistance training, getting to plyometric training, we tend to stop the rehab when we feel good, even if there are lingering deficits that, and especially deficits that we might not know about. Um, so yeah, that's a barrier, uh, but we know that we should be listening to our body. So if the work, you know, if the workout for the day was supposed to be something, but you're on the warm up and you're starting to feel a little bit of ache into the back of the heel, it's probably not a great idea to continue going through the workout. You probably just want to say, I'm just going to take it easy today and revisit in a day or two. Um, you know, the common sense approach to running, basically uh, avoiding our frequent spikes in training. And those spikes could be from a volume standpoint. They could be from an intensity standpoint. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter that much with an Achilles tendinopathy. It, it was previously thought that, it, that an Achilles tendinopathy was more of an intensity related training error, uh, but that those, the studies that tried to divide volume related injuries and intensity related injuries didn't actually end up panning out. So now we just say it's a training error. Um, and that could also include course terrain. So the hills that we're running on and selecting a sustainable training plan, which is going to be individual to everyone. If you've uh, tried a certain way of training and it always kind of ends up in being injured with a pretty similar type of flare up, then that is an example of not a sustainable training plan for you. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I preach clinically from a, a PT and a strength and conditioning standpoint is say, stay strong. And in this case, explosive. So I didn't really cover plyometrics too much in the patellofemoral pain talk because it doesn't seem to be something that is necessary in the rehab. Uh, but from the, from the Achilles tendinopathy standpoint, the explosiveness does seem to be pretty essential. Uh, so we need to have really strong plantar flexors or calves, and we need to have an Achilles tendon that can tolerate that elastic energy storage and release uh, by gradually loading it over time with jumping exercises. And a common question that I get is, isn't running enough as far as that elastic nature to just train the Achilles tendon? Uh, the problem is if your regular training is the thing that is 100%, so let's say running is the highest level elastic activity that somebody does, uh, then you're really close to redlining pretty constantly. If the heaviest thing that your tendon knows is a single leg pogo hop, then running doesn't seem so hard anymore. So there is a difference between training for plyometrics and, and just running. Um, and of course, train all the other running muscles too, but this is an Achilles tendinopathy talk. So uh, I need to have calves and big letters here. Our take home points. Um, yeah, this is a pretty common and often a pretty debilitating injury can last for a really long time. 
seems to be some combination of training errors, calf strength deficits, maybe some biomechanical contributors were probably not great at finishing the rehab. We know how to get through the early stages pretty well. And then once the pain goes away, we kind of just go back to what we were doing, even if we do still have some strength deficits. Should be heavy, should be progressive. So it should change over time. Uh, don't forget your plyometrics and maybe we can prevent it by staying strong and trying to limit bad training decisions. So that is it. Let's open up for Q and A. All righty. If you could stop screen sharing mm -hmm. there, Jason. Thanks so much for uh, for all those details. Um, one thing I wanted to before we get into some of the questions um, uh, ask a little bit about is you talked about um, training the donut, not the hole. And um, I actually, I mean, I've seen some of the, the pictures of this, I mean, actually, when they look at the, the damaged tissue, could you talk a little bit like where that term came from and why it's, in fact, so apt? Yeah, so I think the original, uh, the phrase itself came from the researcher Jill Cook or her, her yeah. group. Yeah. Um, she's Australia, she's yeah. probably the, yeah, the leading yeah. tendinopathy researcher in the world in Australia. Uh, and it was, it was pretty seminal because it used to be thought that we could regenerate this this tendon pathology and, and or restart the inflammatory process and and have the fibers realign themselves and none of that stuff happens uh, it's basically that it just it gets disorganized and then what we're doing by loading the tendon is making the healthy tendon cells thicker and just taking the place of where that disorganized space is essentially it's a little more complex than that but that's the way that i see it in my brain yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I mean, I, I had the same when I saw her, when I saw her images and, and something, I was like, oh, well, that <laughs> makes total sense then because yeah. it really is kind of this situation where like the, the cells in the middle, I don't say they're dead, but they're not useful. Um, yeah, and and kinda, so, and so you got to build up around it, which, you know, but it's sort of nice that you that it happened. But. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on into the questions. Uh, Joe Basler, uh, you got the first question about uh, uh, where pain goes comes from I was quick I was quick in um yeah <laughs> so thanks Jason this was this was yeah. really great um I am actually currently kind of like you know dealing with a with an AT or not it's kind of unclear um <laughs> could be anything who knows probably starts in the hips anyway be um, yeah. <laughs> um but you know I, I hear I, I saw what you said about sort of like um specifically like you know um flat surfaces and not firm surfaces and all that. Um, in, in my specific case, I, I'm actually finding sort of that softer surfaces feel better than firm surfaces and, and a few other things. So yeah. like if that happens, does that suggest to you that like, you know, even though the pain seems to be in the right spot, does that suggest to you that maybe it's a slightly different kind of injury or is, is that just sure. maybe we try something else? Yeah, you're right. So, so using some of those risk factors as like a diagnostic criteria, basically. So if it, if it didn't, you know, kind of happened to the opposite, would I still think that it was an Achilles tendinopathy? I would say in general, Achilles tendinopathy has such a high base rate, which is just the base rate being the chances that I see one as it walks in the door. Um, the biomechanical factors that you mentioned are some of the weaker risk factors. So I probably wouldn't weight those too much in my diagnostic process, uh, so much as we have a couple special orthopedic tests, uh, which are basically squeeze the tendon. And if somebody says, yeah, that's my pain, then yeah, it's an Achilles tendinopathy. <laughs> Ouch, uh, don't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, and there are some other ones like you, you squeeze the tendon and then move them through dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. If somebody is in full dorsiflexion, um, sometimes that actually alleviates their symptoms with point pressure on it. Uh, but those are, those are kind of like tests that you only put a little bit of stock into. A lot of it comes for just from the subjective history of here's when it came on and I'm constantly trying to link it to was this an overuse overload of some kind? And if it wasn't at all, and someone just says, yeah, I was just walking one day and I started to get this pain, then I'm starting to think about some, some differential diagnoses because most of the time the tendinopathy has to be this too much too soon flare up. Okay. Actually, I have a, maybe a quick follow-up and oh, yeah. I, I admit this is kind of uh, built on, on previous stuff that I learned far too long ago, but like 
I was I was once taught that um, you know if you have pain somewhere, the likelihood is that like the actual issue is not there. That it's like you know a muscle up higher, up lower. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so in this case, I guess like the, the follow up question is like, is it is it possible that I like have a calf problem that's just presenting on the Achilles? So the uh, tendinopathy in general is actually. Uh, they're one of the few pathologies where some of the diagnostic criteria are the pain has to be within about a thumb's length. So uh, this is actually a, a, a really good example of a pathology where the problem is exactly where the source of the pain is. Uh, and actually, the closer you get to the foot and ankle, the more common that is. So from a biomechanics standpoint, most of the time in the foot, especially where the problem is, is where you feel it. Um, mm. it's, it's probably least like that in the lumbar spine. So oftentimes that's where we're just like, yeah. we don't even know what the cause of this low back pain is. We take <laughs> all these images and yeah. And it's still just like, is a mystery to us. Um, yeah. so yeah, in, in this case, uh, t most tendinopathies are the, the problem is exactly where it is. A calf, a calf strain or a calf tear in origin, uh, is pretty broad, you have a lot of tenderness over the muscle belly itself, uh, probably some swelling, things like that. Um, and a compartment syndrome would also, uh, which it was a differential diagnosis that I didn't put on here, but something that you might see in the lower leg uh, would, would be accompanied by a lot of like pressure and maybe some vascular or neural symptoms. Um, so yeah, this is kind of, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's generally pretty easy to diagnose an Achilles tendinopathy. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, Pete, you've got a question about the uh, exercise specifics. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, is it best to do the exercises on both legs or just the affected one? Yeah, I, I would always do them on both legs. Um, for, so for a single leg calf raise, you can take your rest period by working the other side. And then if, you know, once you get to some of these higher intensities of, of resistance, you probably need a little bit more rest in between sets anyway. Uh, but yeah, always a good idea to work both sides, especially because if we're going to, we're going to get the performance benefits out of it, we want to work both sides anyway. There was a, there's a, an old far side of people doing arm wrestling and you know, the other guy's got his <laughs> arm up there. He's got the other arm under the table and it's like five times as large. And that's what I always think of when, when yeah. people are like, oh, I wonder if I should just do one side. Like, well, no. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, it's a, and it's a good excuse as a, on the performance side, particularly as we've been learning more and more about that, um, to be able to, to, to get some extra benefits. If we're yeah, going to exactly. the rehab, we may as well benefit. Right. What a good sell. Better. Yeah, really. Um, okay. Chad also has a, a question about the, uh, the, the exercises. Chad, why don't you go ahead and unmute? Okay. I mean, Chad's not hearing us. Um, okay, well, why don't we hold off on Chad and Jen, you have a question about icing. Oh, you got to unmute there. Let's see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, that was me doing it. Okay. There you go. I did it. Okay. I unmuted you. Problem is, is when okay. I unmuted you, then you immediately clicked to mute again. I was like, oh no. I was muted. Okay. So I guess I, I'm coming from the standpoint where I, uh, about two years ago, I had, um, you know, acute tendinopathy, which I did, you know, full PT. All of a sudden, one day it was just gone, better, and never had any problems again until, you know, recently starting to run some more. I'm just getting little twinges of, of pain in the Achilles. So I'm just wondering about, you know, a, um, icing and routine of, of icing, you know, regularly and, or I guess another addition to that, I've seen, um, oh, a brace, like a, a brace that's got some like surrounding the Achilles. Sure, like a lace up, uh, or a sleeve kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so as far as, I... right. As far as icing goes, um, it's, it's purely for pain relief. So, um, won't actually affect the physiology. Uh, 
it's even debatable whether it really decreases inflammation after acute injury. Certainly for a, for a chronic injury, there's not really that much inflammation present in the first place. Um, so yeah, I, I have no problems with ice. I'll use it clinically just for if people want to go extra hard with their exercises, be a little sore afterwards and slap some ice on it to take the pain levels down. That's a fine thing to do as long as they're, they're following the, the guidelines of not being any worse off 24 hours later. Um, as far as the brace goes, uh, there's, there's not really much evidence for any kind of bracing or taping with a tendinopathy, uh, not, you know, the, the evidence for a lot of the bracing and taping seems to be pretty joint specific, uh, in that like for, for the foot, uh, it can be really beneficial for, for somebody to be taping like a plantar heel pain. Uh, whereas for say like the shoulder taping doesn't really seem to do much. Um, so I think. There's probably a couple of things at play there. Bracing in general, we know, doesn't really keep anything in place. It kind of just feels like a hug. So it increases this perception of a little bit more safety in the area. That's, in my mind, probably why it may help with some pain relief if it does for some people. Um, just kind of gives them confidence that things are a little bit more protected there. Uh, the other thing is that as far as like the taping, maybe working in the foot, but not really so much in other places is again, going back to the, in the foot itself, the you're kind of closer to biomechanics really mattering. So you can really kind of guide the way that somebody's foot is hitting the ground. If you're taping the bottom of a foot, or if you're wearing a foot orthosis, uh, compared to further up the chain, you can't really affect it that much. Um, so that's probably my, that's my hypothesis on why some of it works and some of it doesn't. Um, as far as the Achilles goes, yeah, it's kind of a, somebody has one lying around and they feel better wearing it. It's not going to hurt them. So they can, they can do that, but I wouldn't recommend that they go out of their way to, to buy one or use one if they don't want to. Okay, cool. So basically then more, more, more focus on the, um, strengthening. You know, yeah. Kind of yeah. It's pretty much the gold standard. <laughs> All, all right. Um, so Chad says his microphone is broken, and and Chad's Chad's in Nova Scotia right now, so uh, so he has a, he has a, an excuse for having uh, um, ish, network issues potentially as well. Um, he's asking when you have isometrics, how long do you uh, have your patient hold the contraction? I've read recommendations of thirty to forty seconds, but this often causes a decrease in compliance. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I typically stick with what's been published most in the literature of five sets of 45 second holds with a full recovery between. Uh, for most people, that full recovery is just 45 seconds of waiting, so one to one work rest ratio. Uh, but that said, there have, been, there have been studies after that that have used different protocols where they keep the same amount of total time under tension. So uh, that what 225 seconds total for five sets of 45 seconds, they've broken it up into like 20 second holds, but still done the to same total volume. And it seems to have the same effect. Um, so from an exercise standpoint, uh, I would say you can manipulate things like intensity and time under tension to get what you are looking to get. So if I want somebody to develop more strength endurance, I may say, push as hard as you can hold for consistently for 45 seconds. And that's going to get them a little bit more strength endurance because they're kind of holding a base level of force for 45 seconds, which is a pretty long time. Uh, compared to if I want somebody to develop more max force, say in like the using the belt on that soleus exercise, I may have them push into it as hard as they can for three seconds and then rest for 10 seconds and do a bunch of rounds of that just until they feel like they're not getting a quality effort out of it anymore. Uh, and that's going to work more on max force. Then your, your total time under tension isn't going to be quite as much, but it's not really going to matter because you had more quality in that time frame. The other consideration is going to be if we're starting off with exercises like this, they have to generally be tolerable and they have to pass that 24 hour rule of if they do this bout of isometrics, they should not be more sore 24 hours later. So we may need to manipulate our sets, repetitions, time length. Uh, based on somebody's irritability. Uh, so if they, all they can do is hold for five to 10 seconds, I'm fine to start there. But I usually, yeah, work up to that five sets of 40 seconds. And then that's usually a pretty common exercise that I'll still have people do on, on off days as just a way to continuously load the tendon. 
uh, because it does seem like the 10 needs a pretty cyclical amount of loading and pretty frequently. We don't need to blast it all the time, but some amount of loading pretty regularly is how it adapts pretty quickly. So um, to getting back to what Joe was talking about a little bit um, before, you were saying that the, the problem really is right at that spot. Um, does that suggest that uh, other kinds of therapies, massage, ART, whatnot, probably don't really have much much of a role with Achilles tendinopathy in particular because it's such a such an isolated little spot that wouldn't be as related to it further up the chain? Yeah, certainly I don't recommend aggressively frictioning a tendon, uh, which is something that used to happen in commonly in rehab because the thought was that they needed to restart the inflammatory process. And, you know, it's kind of based off of science that no longer exists. So um, yeah, from certainly from a, uh, what do we do to the tendon itself? I would not really poke it too much. Uh, Cause that's just kind of at, at best it does nothing. And at worst it flares it up. Um, you could, you could make the case for uh, soft tissue work on the calf itself. If somebody is getting some symptom relief with doing that. Uh, but it would purely be on the symptom relief side. It wouldn't, it wouldn't contribute to the overall long-term solution. Um, and sort of related to that, I guess, um, you know, the, there's obviously plenty of uh, injuries that are just a little bit higher up in the soft tissue. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we can get into those and in more potentially in another talk, but I'm just curious, um, is it one of those situations where, a lot of the treatments and um, and preventions and things like that that would do for Achilles tendinopathy would also apply to those. Uh, so say say like uh, calf strain or things like that. Calf strain yeah, or I mean, I mean obviously Severs disease Severs disease is, is a completely different yeah. scenario because that's the adolescence. Right. But you know sure. yeah, and some of these other issues that would be higher up you know, with the gastrox or the soleus, um, that that yeah. kind of area. Yeah, I think the the. The, you, you, you would probably treat the calf strain closer to how you would treat a patellofemoral pain. So thinking more along the lines of the envelope of function uh, so that this, you know, this tissue has just been thrown out of homeostasis and we need to get it back to where it was uh, compared to the tendinopathy, which is we need to bring up this other tissue to a level that it's never been to take over for this other part of it mm. that's not working so well anymore. Um, especially too, when, whenever we rehab tendons, especially in the lower extremity, there has to be that elastic nature to the end stages of rehab. Um, that may not necessarily be the case for some muscle related injuries for the calf. I still always do plyometrics because the calf is attached to the Achilles tendon. Um, so even though the calf doesn't have to have a plyometric nature to its tissue, uh, it needs to contract hard. And actually the, the role of the calf in running and in jumping is to almost contract isometrically. So the calf doesn't really go through this long elongation and contraction when we're running and jumping. It actually just kind of contracts isometrically. And then the tendon itself does all of the elongation and, and release. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the role of the calf is to be really, really strong, but also to transfer force and to do it quickly. So the, the doing it quickly part is pretty important as far as uh, you know, our, ex our exercises. So yeah, I think you can, you can pretty much make the case that all injuries in the running world can be treated with progressive resistance training and then progressing into plyometric and power training and then managing training load. It's like, the, uh, that's the only thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> Lather, rinse, repeat. Yeah. Joe, you had a follow up here? Uh, yeah, so I, I was looking at the, the kind of your, your sort of, it looked like it felt like four steps uh, treatment strategies, although I understand right. it's, you know, but basically I'm, I'm really curious about um, sort of at what point we can add plyometric training, like do sure. I get that resistance training really done or, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the criteria to advance through the stages, um, it's definitely, yeah, there's not, there's, there's certainly not hard published criteria. Like you need to be at a certain level of strength before doing this. Oftentimes uh, symptoms will be the guide through the process. So even if, if somebody doesn't necessarily have the strength symmetry side to side, 
if their symptoms are really, really minimal, I'm probably starting them off with plyometrics sooner rather than later, or I'm, or I'm increasing their running volume sooner rather than later, just because they can tolerate it. It's not going to make it any worse. Uh, and that's important to note too, the tendinopathy, you don't make it structurally worse once that initial onset has happened. So during the course of rehab, we're not seeing a, a degeneration of the tendon. If somebody flares up, the degeneration happened some time away while back. Uh, and the inflammatory process was probably the initial insult. So that first couple of days where it's, it is actually inflamed and kind of sore, that's probably where we see the damage itself. But then through the process itself, we're not damaging anything. So we're kind of playing a lot of guess and check because we can afford to do that. Um, and yeah, what I'd like to see is before clinically, and this is coming more from uh, like ACL rehab literature, which is very in depth on this kind of stuff, is 80% strength symmetry side to side before I'm progressing people into power or plyometrics. And that's just because if somebody doesn't have 80% strength, then the lowest hanging fruit is still developing strength. Because you can work on rate of force development and speed, but if you're, you're running really fast to get to a red light because you can't actually produce that much force. It didn't really matter that you could go fast in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so that 80% marker is, is usually something that I use in combination with, with their symptoms as they're progressing through stages. Um, yeah. I always, always like to use that 24 hour rule, uh, just cause it is a pretty telling measure of, yeah, we either overloaded it or we loaded it, but it tolerated it. So let's keep cracking it on. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Any final questions, folks? Um, and if not, let me just remind everyone, if you scroll up to the top of the, actually, I'll just here, I'll paste it in here again, um, give you the, the link to the survey. I'd appreciate it if you'd fill that out. Uh, it should just take a minute or two. Very easy. Um, but uh, if not, uh, let's uh, give Jason a big hand. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for sharing all this, Jason. We'll, yeah, we'll thanks for having up. me. We'll, we'll virtually clap with our <laughs> mics muted. <laughs>